our short-term goals are to manipulate this clay layer. Once we do that and get down to the next geologic zone where these large watersheds will be, there's a lifetime of exploration. So months, years, tens of years, as our techniques and as our equipment evolves and gets better and better, we'll be able to go further and further, and it could be a lifelong project just exploring the aquifer in this area. That's me, 25 years ago. I was about to start a journey that would change my life, and I knew that, but I wasn't sure how, until now. Silver Springs has always been known as the world's largest artesian spring, meaning more water comes pouring out of the ground here than anywhere else in the world. So as cave explorers, we know that the water creates the caves. The more the water flow, the bigger the caves, the more the exploration. The geologists and hydrologists I was working with were telling me this water rained here 200 years ago, as many as 50 miles away from here. All through the decade of the 90s, the average outflow of Silver Springs was pretty close to like 900 cubic feet per second. It's an amazing amount of water. With the power of the water and the flow that we were feeling, it was real easy to seem that this was an uncompromisable power. It seemed to be here forever. There was no way this would be compromised in our lifetimes. But we were very wrong. In 1993, I had the opportunity of a lifetime to spend an entire year pushing and exploring the Floridian Aquifer here at Silver Springs. Cave divers have been exploring the Floridian Aquifer since the 60s and the 70s, but no one was able to get very far in Silver Springs because of the complex geology. This complex geology had kept this massive spring virgin for decades until we came along. In cave exploration, we follow the water flow to try and find out where this water is coming from. That is the lead that keeps us going. We read the geology. We look for the stratigraphic layering that is most conducive for creating caves. As soon as we started the exploration, going through the upper level of geology with its crumbly nature, we realized real fast that we had to create an exploration unit that was not attached to our body. This way we could manipulate these tiny little restrictions and through these really little caves as fast and as simple as possible. So cave diving at Silver Springs, we developed and perfected the no mount system. A scuba diving cave exploration system that was completely unattached to your body except for one small harness that kept it from getting away. It's just too ironic that the world's largest artesian spring demanded the world's smallest compact cave diving life support system. To do this type of exploration, you need the mindset of a top astronaut and the physiology of a top athlete with the adventure of Tarzan. A lot of people ask me, how can you do this? And I say, it's about being one with your environment. On these dives, I was just as comfortable in this cave as I was sitting on my couch. 
That calmness let me make the right decisions and that's why I'm here today. The next question is usually why? Why do you do this? And really, there's several reasons. But as an artist, my primary goal is to produce a historical document showing what lies beneath us, a cave map. The mapping process is a basic compass and tape survey through triangulation. We start by installing a continuous guideline throughout the cave. This guideline is a thin nylon line that serves as our navigational reference, but more importantly, it's our database for all the survey, science, and art data that we collect in the cave. With the survey data, we are able to plot our explorations and see exactly where we went and where we are going. These maps are never finished. It's a constant work in progress for generations of explorers. Continually exploring, mapping, surveying. Our survey data is first recorded at every point where the guideline changes in direction. These points are our survey stations. At each station, we stop and record the depth, direction, and distance. Then we go on to the next station to do it again and again and again, and there's always another station. So, let's go. Let's dive into the Floridian Aquifer. Follow along as we take a trip through the Silver Springs cave system. The dives were extremely stressful, but I had a secret weapon with me. Ken Peekman. Ken and I have been climbing around in caves together since we were teenagers in the 70s. We had an ultimate mental connection in the cave. We knew exactly what we were thinking and how we would react. That level of trust created a higher level of calm that is required to do something like this. Remaining calm in the most stressful situation. Also, when you need a hand, you could always just grab one of Ken's. Approaching the main vent, the flow was so strong we would have to stay off to the side to save energy for the dive. As soon as we enter the cavern, we're looking at our first major restriction and a big pile of loose boulders to descend through. As 
we are exploring into new areas, we are seeing a part of the earth that has never been disturbed by any humans. A completely virgin environment. And still, what hits me most is the sculpting by the eroding powers of the water flow. It's like living in art. We are traveling inside of Mother Nature's artwork. Just inside, we face a series of rooms and restrictions and more rooms and more restrictions as we work our way to the vertical drop that takes us down to the lower level. Another comforting factor was our equipment. We had sponsors that constantly supplied us with the best, most reliable gear. All our gear was continually new. Our sponsors did everything they could to be sure that we did not have an equipment failure of any kind, and we did not. In cave diving as a whole, there is a recreational industry where just about anyone can get the training, equipment, and experience to safely enjoy visiting underwater caves. But these dives are far from that. When you explore beyond standards, you're at or even over the edge of the envelope. The calculated risk becomes so high that just one small mistake could be too much to recover from. On these dives, the fragile geology was our highest risk factor. When a rock moves in a body-sized cave, your exit can easily be blocked. So the combination of small passages and moving rocks is real scary. Now the real fun begins as we get to the wild side restriction. After squeezing through this body sized tunnel, it's straight down to a whole different world. Descending through the time capsule of geology, we reach a contact zone where the geology drastically changes. 
The porous ceiling is dark brown in color and very fragile. It's full of sea bottom fossils and fractures that let it crumble down on us. The walls are a beautiful cream color, very solid and dense. We named this the clay layer because of its slimy clay-like skin, but it's actually very hard limestone. The slimy skin coating was like greased up walls that let us slip right through. Slipping through was great, but it stirred up the water and created zero visibility exits, like a whiteout. It seems the majority of the water flow is coming from a much deeper source. As it's pushed up from the depths artesianally, it hits the limestone strata we named the clay layer and is diffused into thousands of very small passages called a diversion maze. Some of the walls were so thin, like partition walls, that they would fall over. A big one fell over on team member Tom Morris. It's only because of his ability to stay calm and the clay-like coating that lets you slip through, he was able to work his way out of it. Still, I have never seen Tom's face so pale. Until this, we thought the crumbling ceiling was our biggest problem. Tom's incident in the clay lair was a wake-up call for sure. Our task as explorers was to find a route through the diversion maze down to the next stratigraphic zone and into the big tunnels and rooms that the Grand Floridian Aquifer is made of. Here we've reached the knob. We spent several dives excavating this restriction for safe passage. It leads to an area we call the launch pad for its crazy look. And it seems to be the way forward to launch new exploration.
Ken and I laid these lines 25 years ago and no one has added to them since. But today, equipment is evolving at a rapid pace. Rebreather technology could supply the extended range needed along with eliminating the dangers of our exhaust bubbles. So a young small explorer with a no mount rebreather could reach our goals and break through the clay layer diversion maze and into the large virgin passages of the Floridian aquifer. A little further in and another major restriction. The restricted passages take precious time from our dwindling air supply and after manipulating through more than a dozen of them on any exploration dive it would take a toll on your body. As you're crawling through the fourth or fifth one the main thought going through your head is I'm going to have to do this in zero visibility to get out of here. These caves are still eroding, still growing. The crumbling ceiling and moving rocks is just a natural process of our evolving aquifer. Every day, the fast moving water dissolves a little more limestone. There is very little life back here. Most of the oxygen has been scrubbed out of the water on its long journey through the limestone. The food supply is almost non-existent except for a few very strange bacteria and a few fish that swam back and couldn't find their way out. This is the place for only the most extreme troglobitic life and we saw very little of that. Exploring the clay layer, anywhere the passages widened out, the ceiling would cave in. The breath hold room is a good example of that. We had markers on the line on each side of the breath hold room that told us to hold our breath as we passed through the room. Our exhaust bubbles would dislodge the loose ceiling creating falling rocks and a possible collapse. Unfortunately, some great leads for new exploration sends you right through the breath hold room. Exploring like this, your mind becomes completely computeristic. You are constantly managing your life support system and sorting through hundreds of observations every minute. Every foot forward is a major consideration. You really don't have time to think of anything else but returning safely with as much information as possible.
In this crazy cave of body-sized passages, we determined that the definition of a new room was anywhere big enough for an explorer to turn around. We did a lot of backing out on these dives. The connection room was a significant find. We connected both sides of the cave together from two different entry points. This was important because if a collapse occurred and blocked our exit, we could have an alternative route out. As we turn around to make our way out of the cave, that's when we see the damage our exhaust bubbles created for our exit. Ceiling bleeds from the bubbles in the fractures, whiteouts from the slimy walls of the clay layer, and crumbling rocks. Staying in constant contact with the guideline is like following a breadcrumb trail in Braille. Just an average day of exploration in the Silver Springs cave system. Finally, seeing the sunlight shining into the cavern is an unexplainable experience. It's the truest form of sunbathing. I would just sit there for hours absorbing all the natural artwork. As we follow and map the route of the water flow, it takes us back under the spring and heads southwest, under the buildings and towards the parking lot. The limestone is so porous and fractured that our exhaust bubbles show our trail as we pass underneath the spring. Shortly after the exhaust bubbles surface, our silt is soon to follow. As we map the flow of the water, a lot of it is coming from the southwest. Just underground lies the history of everything that went on through time. Just below the surface is leftovers from modern civilization like beer cans and car tires. As we go down a little further, there's milk bottles and farm equipment from the turn of the century. And just a little deeper is the fossils and artifacts of prehistoric life. It amazes me that right here where I live in the middle of Florida, that an elephant walked right here, ate a palm tree, then headed over to Silver Springs for water and met its demise by the natives. Silver Springs is a known mammoth kill site and all the remains are still here as artifacts. Mammoth, Mastodon, Sabertooth Tiger, Giant Ground Sloth, they are all here along with the people who preyed upon them. These arrowheads have been down here for thousands of years. As we explore into virgin areas, very near the cavern entrance, places where no one has ever been, we make new discoveries of artifacts. It's a humbling experience to see how crazy life was here 10,000 years ago.
After seeing all these fossils and arrowheads firsthand, it makes me think on a much greater scale. All that will stay with me for life. All of this underwater footage was shot in 1993 and is still the only footage from the exploration of the clay layer. Our cameras, lighting, and batteries wouldn't fit through the really tough stuff where exploration continues, so it actually gets a lot harder and a lot crazier. No mount exploration is the craziest form of cave diving. Just 1,000 feet of penetration here is more complicated than 10,000 feet of penetration anywhere else. Before every dive, we thought deeply of what we might be overlooking. What are we missing that could bite us today? It got to the point where our motto was, it's a beautiful life, let's go risk it. And Ken said this to me before every dive. These thoughts keep a healthy fear with you throughout the dive. And if you listen to those fears, you will most likely stop before it's too late. If you've ever felt the fine little hairs on the back of your neck stand straight up, then you probably have risked it all and got away with it. You only get to experience that a few times in life before it bites you. Everyone who dove on this project used up a few of those. There's always another mistake, but not always another recovery. So we stopped the exploration due to an extremely high calculated risk. We did not break through the clay layer, but there are several areas where it seems so close. The discoveries we made gave a new understanding of what lies below us and what else could be there. And the only way to really know is for explorers to go there, and I don't think that will ever change.
I still dive, explore, and map, but I do it within my limitations and the purpose has changed greatly. So how has it changed my life? I was an intrepid explorer, meaning actively diving, exploring, creating expeditions, making discoveries and maps that I thought might have an impact much later in life. Today, my no mount rig is retired here at the Silver River Museum, and in the past decade, we watched Silver Springs outflow drop to below 300 cubic feet per second, mostly due to overpopulation and the poor management of water usage. Now, my role is more of an advocate. These days, the fragile environment of the Floridian Aquifer, the sweet spot of Florida's clean water, is under a constant threat and actually more like under attack from every angle possible. It seems that growth, development, industry, and everything that comes with it has turned a blind eye to protecting the life's blood of our planet, our clean and natural drinking water. It wasn't my plan in life to become an explorer, it just happened. It's not my plan in life to become an advocate, but it's happening. We have to stand up and do everything we can to protect and preserve what we believe in, even when it's such a common sense thing like our clean water. Just think about it. And what are you gonna do without clean water?